Okay, so let me introduce Chris Orton. Judges, please note that this next session has been approved for one hour of judicial education credit for family violence training through the Texas Center for the Judiciary and 0.75 hours of ethics CLE credit. Our next speaker, Chris Orton, was employed by the Travis County Sheriff's Office for 29 years before retiring in 2016. He served the Sheriff's Office as a corrections officer, patrol deputy, and as a detective since 1993. As a detective, he worked in the auto theft unit, juvenile crimes unit, burglary unit, major crimes unit, child abuse unit, and animal cruelty. Detective Orton had a mental health breakdown in his cubicle on December 27, 2006, and was diagnosed with PTSD shortly thereafter. Detective Orton spent the next several years suffering from depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideations, and began to abuse alcohol, and suffered from a variety of other conditions both physically and psychologically. During and shortly after his recovery, Detective Orton began to attend training in critical incident stress management, crisis intervention team, peer-to-peer -peer support, and the Stephen Ministry. Over the last eight years, Detective Orton has trained over 1,000 people on peer-to-peer -peer support and PTSD. In 2018, Detective Orton was hired by Blue Bonnet Trails as a mental health specialist, responding to critical and traumatic incidents and providing peer support to first responders, court employees, school employees, CPS caseworkers, road and bridge crews, and their family. Here to discuss how he learned to work through secondary trauma and help others do the same, Chris Orton. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I've got a presentation that I'm going to to show talk about in a minute, but I took some notes yesterday as I listened to the other speakers, and um, I typed them up. So, because I can't read my own writing. And um, I just wanted to, to highlight and, and comment on a few things. Um, ironically enough, today is a Global Peer Support Day. Um, and here I stand on Global Peer Support Day. Um, peer support being the best job I've ever had. Um, having the opportunity to be my brother's and sister's keeper. Um, I was in the Army for three years, and then I was a police officer for 29. And I definitely served my country and my community. But what's so nice about peer support is I'm helping people when they are at their lowest. And I'm able to help them get through that and to get on and, and live a better life. Sort of like the ladies from The Rise. Everything they talked about, basically, in my opinion, was peer support related, advocacy for those who need it. Um, I want y'all to, as I talk today, remember two words, and those two words are be bold. Um, it's gonna be my next tattoo, be bold. Um, being up here today for me is being bold. Um, asking somebody how they're doing is bold because you may not want the answer because the answer might cause you work. And that work could be sitting with somebody who's suicidal. That could be sitting with somebody at the psychiatric hospital while they do the intake process. And so be bold, because if you're bold, I promise you'll save a life. Um, talking about PTSD, and I just happened to see this on the news last night. Does anybody uh, have any idea how many police officers cap United States Capitol Police officers have died by suicide since January 6th. Four. Four. How many police officers have di died by suicide from the Pulse nightclub shooting? How many police officers have died by suicide from um, all the school shootings? 
It's, it happens. All these incidents, police officers, firefighters, medics, dispatchers, um, some of their lives are changed forever and to include suicide. So uh, just putting that out there. Um, I guess I should have started with, um, I really want to thank Judge Nelson and Judge Noacker uh, for having faith in me to make this presentation and all the support I've gotten from my family at Blue Bonnet Trails Community Services. Um, when they offered me the job, I, uh, I told them, I said, you know I'll do this for free. And they're like, no, we'll pay you. I was like, okay. Um, so anyways, um, once I get through this, I'll quit looking down at the paper and I'll look at y'all. Um, but for right now, I need to pay attention to what I wrote down. So yesterday, Judge Hervey uh, said it, it being mental illness, touches everyone. And she mentioned her son and her mom. Well, for me, it's me. It's my 32-year-old daughter who's had to deal with a miscarriage, a preemie, and postpartum depression. It's my 15-year-old grandson who's dealing with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Bad stepfather in his life at one point. And now my 35-year-old son dealing with his 15-year-old son has caused him anxiety and depression. So uh, Judge Hervey uh, spoke the truth. Uh, Dr. Ellis mentioned the word ethics being listed by her name on the uh, roster um, and she talked about equity. And for me, she, she hit the nail on the head. The word ethics is by my name as well. And equity. So where do we, where are our volunteer firefighters? Some of whom make minimum wage and don't have health insurance. But they're seeing the same dead bodies and burned up bodies that the full-time paid insured firefighters have. So Blue Bonnet has stepped up by hiring me and looking for those volunteer firefighters and finding them resources um, so they're not left behind. And I'm, I, I thought a lot about this. I'm not sure if one of my big phrases is be your brother's and sister's keeper. Um, I don't know if that falls under ethics for you. It does for me. I feel it's actually morally bound to be my brother's and sister's keeper, but also ethically. I just, I've, I feel that's uh, what I am called to do. So Dr. Martinez mentioned the word crazy, and he quickly corrected himself and said he shouldn't have used the C word. Calling someone crazy is labeling. And I was king of labelers, even to when I got hired by Blue Bonnet. And my, my boss, which she'll hate that I just used the boss word, um, Tiffany, she, she had told me that I had a lot to learn. And I knew what she meant. I didn't need, have a lot to learn about peer support or being my brother's and sister's keeper, but I had a lot to learn about language and using the proper language. <clears throat> so, we call people addicts, alcoholics, or bipolar. Oh, he's bipolar. My mom, uh, a couple years ago, she said, oh, my neighbor Sally, her son is bipolar. Well, you don't correct my mom usually and get away with it. Um, so, I decided to be bold and said, mom, can I educate you a little? And she's like, sure. I says, and you're not gonna get angry. <laughs> she's like, well, why would I get angry? Um, and I said, mom, he's not bipolar. And she said, oh yes, he is. Sally said he is. And I said, no, he's a father, he's a son, he's an uncle, he's a Christian, he's an American, he's a Texan, he's whatever, but he's not bipolar. He's diagnosed with bipolar. That doesn't define him. Um, back in 1990, oh, no, back in 1988, 
I typed it wrong. When I was at the Travis County Sheriff's Office, somebody decided to create a T-shirt. And the T-shirt said TCSO, big, bold block letters. And it had a pair of handcuffs on it. And it said, used by the best, worn by the worst. And guess what? I wore that T-shirt. I eventually outgrew it. Um, but I wore that T-shirt. Well, I saved that T-shirt for some reason, and I recently found it. And I just kept looking at it. And I was like, worn by the worst. No. Their mothers, their fathers, their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their whatever they are, Americans, they're Texans, but I'm, we're labeling them as the worst. So pay attention to your words from now on about labeling. Um, as far as the C words go, as a peer support guy, I'm going to give you some C words. Compassion, care, cheer, cheer on, be a cheerleader for your people, your friends, cards, send people cards. For no reason, send somebody a card. Call someone, another C word. Coffee. Hey dude, let's go get a cup of coffee. And the most important C word of all, if you're gonna do this, is confidentiality. Because if you're going to peer support somebody, and um, I know Judge Nelson's back there, and say I was peer supporting somebody from Blue Bonnet, and I went and told Judge Nelson, hey, I'm uh, peer supporting Sally, and she's got all this going on in her life. And then Judge Nelson says, well, I'm, she tells Andrea and Tiffany, so what, so what happened now? Sally's business is all over the place. So will Sally ever trust anybody? No. And Sally might tell other people, hey, don't trust Chris Orton because he'll spread your business. So confidentiality. <clears throat> Lieutenant Murphy yesterday talked about officers responding to calls where a child isn't listening to a parent. Well, back in the 80s and 90s, as a deputy, I would have went to that call and I would have asked the parent, when's the last time you just whooped your kid? How they did it when I was in the 60s and 70s. You just got a whooping. Well, today I wouldn't do that. I would sit down with the kid, hear his side. I'd sit down with the mom, hear her side. And I'd say, hey, have you ever heard of Blue Bonnet Trails Community Services? We have resources. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's amazing how I've changed in 30-some years. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about it. Any, any names I have used or will use, I have permission from those people. So there's a man and a woman sitting in front of me at church, uh, oh man, four or five years ago. And I recognized them as members, but I did not know their names. And they normally didn't sit in front of us. You know how at church, you always sit in the same seats. And uh, they were sitting in front of me. And they're about 10, 15 years older than me. And they were holding hands the whole service, which I thought was super cute. But I noticed they were crying off and on throughout the whole service. So afterwards, I introduced myself. And it was cedar season. And I asked them, is it cedar? Or is it legit tears? And they both started sobbing. And they were like, no, it's legit tears. And they went on to tell me that Virginia had been just been diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer. Ah, excuse me. So I was like, okay. So I called them a couple of days later and I said, hey, can I come over and hang out with y'all for a little bit? And they said, sure. So I went over there to peer support, Stephen Ministry, be a friend, whatever you want to call it. And I became friends with Virginia and Patrick. And 
her cancer got worse and worse, and she went to Houston, then she went to Sloan, Kettering, Kettling, something up in New York, like this great cancer hospital. She eventually died. They were like high school sweethearts. So Patrick was heartbroken. So now I really turned up my peer support and I was with Patrick and called Patrick almost daily. So anyways, Patrick would cry. He didn't want to live. He told me, he goes, I'm really thinking about going to join uh, Jenny, he'd call her. And I just kept talking to him and, and being there for him and supporting him. And I saw a turn after six months, eight months, a year, and he was doing a little better and a little better. And he eventually met another lady. He had told me he would never date another woman. And he met a lady and he brought her to church. And he sat, they sat with me and my grandkids. And uh, it, uh, it went well. So a few more weeks go by and Patrick texts me Saturday and he's like, hey, you gonna be in church Sunday, tomorrow? And I was like, yes, sir, I'll be there. And he goes, okay, great. I have a gift I wanna give you. And I'm, I'm not that guy, I mean, your thanks is all I need. Or you doing better is all I need. I don't need a gift. So anyways, so Patrick comes in, I'm standing behind my chairs, which I always do, and I, har I harass all the church members as they walk by, because I've been there 30 years. That's part of my job. And uh, Patrick walks in, and he's got tears in his eyes, and he holds his hand out like this. So I hold my hand out like this. What do y'all think he gave me? A nine millimeter bullet. Best gift I ever got in my whole life. And I will save it forever. So, be bold. I was bold to talk to Patrick in Virginia. It was none of my business. Well, it was my business. So, be bold. Um, Real quick story, another quick story. Way at the McDonald's in Hutto, Texas, guy rides up on his bicycle. I'm standing there waiting for my to-go bag. Guy gets off his bike, he walks in. Based on his appearance and based on how he's walking, I can tell he has mental health issues. It's, it's, it was just obvious. Well, before I started working at Blue Bonnet, if that man would have started walking towards me, I would have done this. And I, would, and, and I would have inched away from him because, not because I was scared of him, but I don't know what to say to him. Well, here he walks and I just stand there and he comes and he stands next to me. And I look over and I go, hey man, how's it going? And he's like, it's going good. And he goes, I go, uh, what are you doing? Because he wasn't getting food. And he's like, well, and this guy was in his, probably in his 40s, and he's like, I'm, I'm here to talk to the manager. And I was like, oh, did something happen? And he's like, well, no, she might give me a job. And I was like, oh, that's neat. And he goes, she's going to let me sweep the floors. Okay? So I showed an interest in this man. I made him smile. And he got something out of it. But guess who got more out of it? I did. So be bold. Um, how many of you have smelled stale alcohol on a coworker? Or know a, D a district attorney who's been arrested for DWI? An assistant DA who's died from cirrhosis? A county attorney dying by suicide? I know all of those all of those, just in the Central Texas area. I personally, Chris Orton, consider prosecutors, stenographers, bailiffs, court clerks, judges, defense attorneys, et cetera, because I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, all of you are first responders. When I was a patrol deputy, I went, I saw the dead kids, I called a detective, 
and I was done. Then when I was in homicide, the deputy called me. I went out there, took pictures, wrote a report, and if it was a, a, a homicide case or a child abuse case, whatever, what do I do with all those pictures and all those reports and all those statements? I forward them to the prosecutor. Well, who reads all that stuff over and over and over and over to make the best case they can possibly make? The prosecutor does. And they're looking at these pictures of this dead baby or this dead 12-year-old. So um, that's secondary trauma. And it's, I, I'm telling you, I feel that the folks that work in the courtrooms are, uh, are uh, just as prone to PTSD as the first responders that are out on the street. So, <laughs> so anyways, I'm going to do my presentation now. And, there were, and I, I, I did a really good job on whoever I quoted. I remembered their names, but this lady I did not quote and this lady from yesterday, but she said that the only thing between lunch and y'all was her. Well, now the only thing between lunch and me is me. So, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I thought that was funny. Um, and then Judge Kazin, he said that he is twice the Marine he once was. I'm twice the soldier I once was. So uh, <laughs> that's why I need the lunch, so I can maintain that. Um, anyway, all right. None of that's part of my typical presentation, but I just, I don't know, I was moved to do that. All right. So now I'm going to talk about... My next slide will be a timeline, and the timeline will keep me focused and on track with what I want to tell you. <clears throat> There's a screen down here that's showing me the five pictures, and I'm ready to start crying. <clears throat> so the guy in the middle is Sergeant Gerald Riley of the Detroit Police Department. He was in the Michigan National Bank in, on December 8th, 1972, six days before I turned 10 years old with his two-year-old son. Two guys come in and rob the bank. Sergeant Riley decides to, off duty, he decides to intervene. There's a shootout. Sergeant Riley is able to shoot both guys, but they shoot him. And when he falls to the floor with a non-life-threatening injury, one of the bad guys walks up and shoots him in the head and kills him in front of his two-year-old son. And his four other children and wife were out in the parking lot waiting for him. I believe he was there cashing his Detroit Police Department paycheck. So when I go to bed, so, so when I go to bed at night, when I'm 10 years old, what's racing? Oh, my dad was a Detroit police officer. So what's going through my mind? Right? The top left picture is Keith Ruiz. We worked in the jail together. He, uh, we drank beers together. And on February 15th of 2001, he was breaking into a, a house of a drug dealer. And it was a trailer house, so the door opens out instead of in. So he couldn't ram it. They were prying it. And the bad guy stuck his fist through the window of the door, aimed down, and shot Keith in the shoulder. The bullet went all over his insides and killed Keith. And I was the one of two crime scene detectives. So I get to, uh, I was there about 16 hours processing the scene and collecting evidence. <clears throat> and then there's Amy Donovan, top right, in 2000, on October 31st of 2004, she was, uh, her and her partner were chasing some bad guys. The bad, the, Amy took off on foot to chase the bad guy. Her partner put the car in reverse. I believe it was reverse. And he's speeding to get wherever, and he accidentally ran Amy over and killed her. <clears throat> Jessica Hollis, bottom left. 
She died on September 18th of 2014. Um, she was working a district she wasn't super familiar with. There was some major flooding going on. She hit a low water crossing, washed her away. Her last words to the dispatcher was, I'm being washed away, I'm gonna get out of my car and try to swim to a tree. You think that dispatcher maybe suffered some PTSD from hearing Jessica's last words and all her shift partners that were on the street that night? And then Sergeant Hutchinson, um, July 25th of 2016, he gets home at one in the morning from his shift, I think it was one in the morning, and he yells on the radio that there were suspects in his backyard stealing something. And he goes to confront the suspects and the suspects kill him. That was the story, but that wasn't the truth. The truth was that Sergeant Hutchinson made that story up and shot himself in the head to make it look like a suicide or a homicide. Sergeant Hutchinson was two weeks away from retirement and there had already been a Facebook page created for his retirement party and I had already RSVP'd to go to that party. So this man killed himself as his 33 year career ended. All right, so this timeline, um, you can see it starts, I hope you, oh yeah, you should be able to see that. It starts in 1962, that's when I was born. And then you see 1967, it says the word riots. Well, Detroit had riots in 1967. My dad was a rookie police officer in 1967. I was five years old. Do you believe I still remember some of it? I remember smelling, because I lived in the city, not a suburb. The riots weren't in my neighborhood, they were miles away. But I remember smelling smoke from the burning buildings. I remember my mom going up to churches to help cook meals and I was in tow. And I saw what back then I termed army men and army vehicles. I'm guessing it was the National Guard. But I saw that. And then obviously I already told you about Sergeant Riley on December 8th of 1972. So when you're five years old and you're 10 years old, and you can see I bracketed 1967 to 1980, and the word Detroit, and there's a number of 37 there. Does anybody know what 37 means? 37 is the, is the number of police officers that died in the line of duty in Detroit. 37. So what was I taking in as a little boy? And my dad was a Detroit police officer. And some of these guys were his partners and his friends. <clears throat> so... 1980, my dad finally had enough, and he quit. He quit being a police officer. So 1987, I started the Travis County Sheriff's Office. I had just gotten out of the Army, so you know I was super cool. I was super tough. Um, that first day I worked, it was Saturday or Sunday. I know it was a weekend. Show up was at quarter to seven. I got there at 630 because quarter to seven would be late. And I walked in, brand new badge, but I still polished it. Brand new nameplate. I poked it in my pocket 20, 30 times to make sure it was uniform, I think is the word they used to use in the army, or gig, I don't remember. Anyways, so it was perfect. Polished my jump boots. I wasn't airborne, but I love jump boots because they polish easy. And I was polished, I went and got my hair cut, and any of y'all that were our veterans, and I know there's a bunch of you in here, how do they teach you to march at basic training? They teach you to march with confidence, almost arrogance, and cockiness. Because we're American soldiers, so we're kind of badasses. 
so I walk into the jail like I walked at basic training and in the army with purpose. I was fit, same height I am now, a lot thinner, less gray, and I went in the jail and worked there for three years. If an inmate was acting out in the jail, in a cell, and, the three, and this was before they had all the training where the guys would line up with helmets and goggles and all the gear, we just went in. But I was a tough guy, so I was like, I'll go in first, I don't care. So I would go, because I, I was a tough guy. Um, so in 1990, I went to the street and, uh, I mean, you name it, I saw it. I saw people abuse bodies, their own bodies, other people's bodies, defile each other. Um, I saw people who hung themselves. I carried a seven-year-old by the name of Corey from Hamilton Pool to the parking lot because Hamilton Pool is in a very rural area. It's a treasure of Travis County, actually. You Google Hamilton Pool, it's, it's amazing. Well, this seven-year-old boy named Corey drowned, and I was a street detective at the time. So I get called out there, and a street detective can hopefully keep the detective that's home from having to come out. So I get there, Corey's not to be found. The divers are fixing to go look for him. And EMS leaves, and they leave, left a, back, a backboard there. And it's me and Deputy Bershnik, it's just the two of us. And the sergeant was up in the parking lot handling media, waiting for the medical examiner, whatever. So the divers go out, and they're communicating with the divers up on the bank, and one of the divers on the bank says they found him. So they swim up and hold Corey by the wrist and they pull him up onto the shore just far enough to where he doesn't float back out. Well, Corey was seven, wearing cutoffs, burr haircut, skinny, skinny little kid. Like kids are skinny when they're seven or eight because they're always going. Well, Corey was seven. At that time, my son was 10, burr haircut, more cutoffs all the time. So when I looked at Corey, what did I see? I saw Billy, my son. And I can tell that story right now with very little emotion in my voice. And in a minute, I'll explain how I'm able to do that. So anyways, I um, was on the street from 1990 to about 1994. And then I went and became a detective and worked. Um, the lady who introduced me said I worked, you know, all kinds of stuff. The only thing I've never worked is white collar. I, I'm, um, I can't concentrate on paperwork long enough to do white collar. So, um, but animal cruelty. I sat out in the pasture one time with a horse waiting for the stray deputies to show up so we can take this horse to the vet and get taken care of and the horse died while I stood there. It's just a horse. I'm not even a horse guy. And I sat out in that pasture and I bawled my eyes out because some knucklehead didn't take care of his horse. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about Keith Ruiz and Amy just a little, but Keith Ruiz, his funeral was five or six days after his death. And I went to the church. Oh, and my son decided he wanted to go. He was about 15 at the time, and my wife wanted to go. So they went, and we go to the funeral. We go to the church. No problem. We get to the cemetery. And uh, if you've never been to a police funeral, it's pretty emotional. All the things you can think of, the bagpipes, the trumpet or what taps, the 21 gun salute, the flyover, the riderless horse, and that all sucks. But the thing that sucks the most is last call. 
okay? So when I'm on the street as a deputy and I check out and I fight in progress, the dispatcher would start saying, Unit 211, checking your status. Unit 211, checking your status. And if you don't answer, guess what? Everybody comes running. All your partners come, they call the Austin Police Department, any local police department, they call for, go help Chris, go help 211. <clears throat> and then the other 10 code, when you go home and you're done with your tour, is called 1042. So when I'm done with my shift, I get home, I park my patrol car, I go unit 211, show me 1042, end of service. My day has done. Well, last call at a funeral for Keith, and they turn on radios around the cemetery. Officers, certain officers are known, they have to turn the radios on. <clears throat> and this one, it really hit me. But it said, TAC 23, checking your status, because Keith was TAC 23, tactical, TAC 23. And then there's no answer. TAC 23, checking your status, and there's no answer. Well, there's not going to be an answer. He's in a casket. TAC 23, checking your status, no answer. And then the dispatcher says, by the authority of sheriff, whoever, at the time was Margot Frazier, um, and they say, your tour of service, your tour of duty is done. Godspeed, God bless, and whatever words they use. When I heard those words at Keith Ruiz's funeral at the cemetery, I collapsed. When I saw people collapse on TV, when they heard of stuff, uh, when they lost a loved one, I'd be like, oh my God, people are so dramatic. Oh well, and now I know better. It's not drama, it's legit. And I collapsed to the ground. And some officers in front of my son and in front of my wife. <clears throat> and... these Dallas police officers picked me up and held me. Dang it, I thought I could do it. So anyways, it sucked. So fast forward to 2004, Amy Donovan, Austin Police Department. I didn't know Amy, didn't even know any of her partners, but I went to her funeral. That's what I thought you're supposed to do. And my daughter wanted to go. So she was about 15 now. So I took her and I didn't collapse at when they did last call for Amy, but I had to take a knee because I was gonna collapse. It was horrible. Checking your status, checking your status, no answer. <clears throat> I was crying so hard that a couple of Travis County guys walked up there and like, oh, are you friends with Amy? I was like, nope, didn't even know her. And I remember their faces like, damn, dude, how could you be crying so hard over somebody you don't even know? And I thought the same thing. It didn't make sense to me. So after Amy's funeral, I was like, ha, huh, note to self, don't go to police funerals. So instead of going to police funerals, I would stand on the side of a highway with my homemade American flagpole. And when they drive by, I would either salute, cross my heart, but I had a flag. And guess what? I could do that without crying. <clears throat> so I did that. Well, fast forward to December 27th of 2006, you see the word breakdown. And the lady who introduced me said uh, that I had a breakdown. And I did. I was in child abuse. I had a case that I was reading that was so significant, so, so intense that if it was real, it could literally make a show like Dateline NBC, 2020, 48 Hours, one of those shows. It was horrible. But was it true? Because the mom had been putting these three kids up to lying. So do I put a man in jail who may not be guilty or do I leave him out? And if the kids are telling the truth, they continue to be abused in a 
horrible way. Dungeons and all kinds of stuff. And I'm reading this case, and I was great at triaging cases and working the most important cases first. But while I was looking at this case, I had noticed over on the right side of my desk a stack of child abuse cases. There was about 40 of them. And that's when my breakdown happened. I got tunnel vision. I started seeing blue dots. I was hot. I was cold. I couldn't breathe. I didn't know what was happening. So I leave the building just to get fresh air. Um, and it was cool. Obviously, uh, December 27th, the weather's cool. And I get outside and I just start walking around the building. I'm like, Whew. catch my breath, go back in. As soon as I break the threshold of my uh, uh, cubicle, it starts up again. And I was like, holy moly. So I'm like, I'm done. So I get in my car and I drive home. Don't think, really don't think much of it. And I come back the next day, and it's not as bad as it was the day before, but it's still there. Well, I start acting out. You know, I'm sending, I'm, man, I'm so glad I wasn't on Facebook back then. Um, because I was sending emails to my sergeant, my lieutenant, my captain, my major, my chief deputy, my, my sheriff, sheriff office HR, county HR, all four four county commissioners and the county judge. And my emails very regularly con contain the F word. Why aren't you blank and helping me? I got sick working for y'all and y'all aren't doing anything for me. And um, I said, what's it gonna take? Do I need to go down in front of the courthouse with a gun and maybe get some people's attention? And then the major came out and met with me and he's like, you can't say that. I was like, why not? You're going to do fire me? Because back then I didn't care. And fortunately, we had civil service. So you can't just fire somebody as easy with civil service. But think of all the deputies and officers that work for smaller departments that don't have civil service. And that person starts suffering from mental illness. Do you know what happened to those officers? You usually get fired. They don't get help. Help. They get fired. So um, they put me, they made me go see the staff psychologist, or not staff, uh, the fit for duty psychologist, the contract psychologist. And I took this big long test that had like 10,000 questions called the MMPI. And, uh, and I know I'm exaggerating. Um, and I failed it, which meant I wasn't fit for duty. So it was like, Detective Orton, we need you to leave your gun and badge at home. Um, you can still come to the office, CID, Criminal Investigation Division, and we're going to let you work uh, cases that don't require going out in the street and following up. Basically, no police activity for me till further notice. Part of it was, we're ordering you into therapy. I was like, cool, I want to get better. Do you think they told me how to get a therapist? Nope. They ordered me to go. Do you think they paid for it? Nope. They did not. And over that time, I think the ladies from RISE talked about um, all the physiological things that can be connected to your psychological things. I know I'll forget one, but I was seeing a dermatologist, a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, uh, uh, the one with nerves. Um, thank you, neurologist. Thank you. Um, all that. And while this is going on, guess copay, 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 copay. And the, the dermatologist gave me two pills, a soap, and a an uh, medicated cream or something. So there's four prescriptions just from one doctor. So all these copays. And lo and behold, just as the Orton luck would have it, my, my wife was in the high tech business. And she got laid off from her $55,000 a year job. So we had debt and houses and stuff based on two decent incomes, and that went away. So just added more to our plate, not my plate, our plate. Because your, your loved ones, it's part, they're part of all this. <clears throat> so I started going to therapy. My second, oh, and then when I called to get a therapist... Well, uh, insurance company, what kind of therapist do you want, Mr. Orton? 
was like, I don't know. I need a therapist. And they're like, well, wh wh where would you like your therapist? I said, how about Hutto, which was the community we lived in. Uh, sh 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 we don't have any in Hutto. I said, how about Taylor? Sh 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 nope. I said, how about Round Rock? And she's like, oh, yeah, we got a lot in Round Rock. And she says, well, where would you like them to be? Like, and I was like, I don't know, Mays Road? I said, Mays Road's a big north-south thoroughfare in Round Rock. And she goes, yeah, we have several. And I said, well, give me three names. So she gave me three names, Karen, Bob, and Joe. And I was so f aggravated and frustrated and, and it just, I was everything. I said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a therapist by the toe, da, 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 da. And this poor girl, probably some sweet young lady from Nebraska, and I was being a total jerk to her. And I chose Karen Kaufman. Lo and behold, Karen Kaufman had first responder knowledge. So she was an amazing therapist. <clears throat> so started going to therapy, ended up going to see a psychiatrist, got on Prozac and Klonopin, Klonopan, something like that. Um, that was an as-needed medication. So more copays. And uh, anyway, I got better. I got slightly better and uh, got to go back to regular duty. And in 2010, I heard that the Travis County Sheriff's Office had asked Rick Cosper, one of our most senior, most respected officers, probably in the history of Travis County. This is that guy you'll never hear anybody say anything bad about. And he was a command sergeant major in the Texas National Guard when he retired from there. So he was the man. You know, he taught you to shoot, taught you how to drive, taught you how to write reports, taught you how to write probable cause affidavits. Rick was the man. Well, I heard Rick was teaching a class on PTSD in 2011. And uh, dang, that time goes by fast. And uh, so I got to teach. I called Rick, said, how can I help? And Rick was scared to teach PTSD because it was a new subject to the law enforcement community. So Rick said, I'm going to speak a little quicker now because I, I only have five minutes left. So anyways, um, the mandatory training was every other week, 27 times. I stood up here in front of 40 to 50 employees, every class, and I told my story. But my story was very specific cases, like Corey from Hamilton Pool. It took me about an hour, hour and 15 minutes to tell my story. And now I can tell my story in about two minutes. Um, every time I told my story, I, I, I need more than five minutes. So, uh, every time I told my story, I cried in front of the, my, my partners. All right. So for the sake of getting this done in 2012, I heard about EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. Okay. And I got to go quick. EMDR is still like regular therapy. I go in to see my therapist, Gary Gould. We're going to do EMDR. EMDR is like this, eye movement. It replicates REM sleep. So, I'm sorry. It's the Yankee in me talking with my hands. So um, when I was five and smelled the smoke, when I was 10 and saw uh, Sergeant Riley die, when I went to bed at night, I'm assuming I was holding the covers and I wasn't reaching REM sleep. If you don't reach REM sleep, you don't process your trauma, your memories, your junk, your stuff. So this is how it's done. Eye movement. Your eyes follow the finger. Well, I can't do that. I have ADD. Um, just can't follow a finger. I close my eyes. So Gary got up knee to knee and he taps because it's not about the eye movement. It's about bilateral stimulation of your brain. Okay. So Gary goes, I said, what do you want to work on? I said, well, I want to work on Keith Ruiz because every time I talk about Keith and you can see on that thing, 2011, when I would tell the class I teach, I said, I can't get Keith's blood out of my mind. And then I would cry in front of my 
partners. So we're going to talk about it. So here we go. Chris, how did that night start? And he's tapping my knees. And I said, well, I got a text or a page said officer down, suspect down. I was in homicide at the time. Well, just getting a page that says officer down could be traumatic. So I, he, I'm talking to him. He'll ask you, what's your anxiety level between 1 and 10, and where do you feel it? I said, 10, and I feel it right here. So tap, 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 um, and they do it in what they call a set. And he'll go, what do you notice now? And I said, and my eyes are closed, because I think better with my eyes closed. And he go, I go, I see the door. And he goes, tell me about the door. And I said, well, the door where the bad guy put his fist through the glass and shot Keith and killed him. So I'm sobbing through this whole process. It was a two and a half hour session, and I'm going to tell it to you in a minute or two. So we get through the door, catch my breath. We get back into it. What do you notice now? Oh, my God, I still see the blanking door. Where do you see it? I go in the evidence room. Every time I go in the evidence room for one of my other cases, there's the door where my friend got killed. Catch my breath, get back into it. What do you notice now? I said, oh my God, I still see the door. Where are you at? When I walk into the uh, courtroom to testify, there was the door. Tunnel vision. Didn't see the prosecutor, didn't see the judge. All I saw was the door. Okay. I'm sobbing, but you notice I keep talking about the door. What did I tell the class 27 times that I noticed in 2011? The blood. Did The blood never came out of my mouth during EMDR therapy. I always thought it was the blood, but it was the door, right? So everything I've told you about this EMDR session is best I recall, but what I'm about to say is exactly the words I said at the end of the two and a half hours. What do you notice now? In full-blown hysterical tears, I said, when's my dad gonna die? When's my dad gonna die? So did I say that as a 50-year-old? Or was that the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old? So, was Keith's Death and Jessica's death, traumatic to me, yes. But I believe they were, they were triggering to the 60s and 70s. So um, I just got the stop sign, but I'm, I'm, and I'm one more minute. Um, so remember I quit going to police funerals? 2014, Jessica died. I mentored her a little bit, looked at her as a little sister. I went to her funeral. At the cemetery, I'm standing in formation. I look over and I'm like, crap. It was a Marine, Craig Miller. And I knew if I said, if I fall, or don't let me fall, hold me at last call. <clears throat> and Craig, instead of being a smart mouth, like a normal Marine would be to a soldier, he's like, I got you, bro. So they do everything. They do last call. He looks at me, he holds his hands up, and I'm like, I'm good. A couple normal tears. When Hutch died, I stood in formation. I didn't ask anybody to hold me. When they did last call for Sergeant Hutchinson, a couple normal tears, and that was all. Since April 27th of 2012, so we're coming up on what, 10 years, I've not had one road rage incident. Who in here can say that? That's what I think. I haven't been in one argument with anybody. So on April 27th of 2012 with my EMDR therapist, Gary Gould, he created a folder. No, I created a folder. He guided it. But I created a folder, which I titled the Dead Cop Folder. And all that, and all that junk up in my brain since I was a little boy went into a folder. Keith went into a folder. Jessica went into a folder. Craig went into a folder. Sergeant Riley went into a folder. Because your brain's set up to handle this stuff if it gets in the right folder. So 
People, I see people on Facebook all the time. Oh, insomnia, I can't sleep. And I just type the initials in EMDR. And then message them and say, hey, try EMDR. Because they might not be sleeping because of the trauma they endured as a child. Okay? So I wish I had a little more time, but I don't. Um, so I, I have uh, to yesterday Professor Shannon. The quote was, and I forgot my sunglasses, but he put on his sunglasses and he said, the future's bright. Hell yeah, it is. And then I have homework for you. I would like, this, home, this was given a homework assignment that was given to me in 2014 at some training I went to. Call someone today or tomorrow or in the near future that meant a lot to you, that mentored you, that helped you. And they don't know how much you appreciate them and tell them. I told this to Tommy May, who was my mentor as a detective, 30 years older than me. When I was 32, he was 62. He was my detective training officer. So when I left training that day after I got the homework assignment, I called Tommy May, who just had his 89th birthday this past weekend. And I called him, and Tommy was very stoic, Texan. You know, he was uh, DPS for 30 years and Travis County for 10 years, and he was just very, very stoic. And I called Tommy. And I said, Tommy, you taught me how to be a better man. You taught me how to be a better father. You taught me how to be a better husband. You taught me how to be a better Christian. You taught me how to talk to the bad guys. Because I always thought I had to be tough to talk to the bad guys. No. Tommy taught me all that stuff. And I know this has nothing to do with PTSD. But do yourself a favor and call somebody and tell them. You know, Tommy started crying. He couldn't even talk. So that's your homework, okay? And in closing, um, just be bold. And if you ask somebody how they're doing and they're like, all right, and you feel, no, they just lied to me, don't let it go. Reach out to them. Thank you all. Oh.